All right. Thanks very much, Lorena. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really nice to see everyone in this virtual space. And uh, thanks so much for joining Michael and I today for our our, uh, our conversation uh, about some of our community-based work uh, here in Regina and what brings us to to today and some of the things that we do in the community. And so as Lorena mentioned, Michael and I are going to co-present, but we're also going to sort of chime in and uh, ping pong off each other a little bit um, as we go. Uh, so uh, bear with us while we get, get into the flow of things. We also have a little bit of a video as well. Um, so I'll have to stop sharing my presentation and pull up the video. And so thanks for your patience um, uh, with that as well. And uh, welcome to those of you who are joining us from the community too. I know that some some folks are here as a part of the Indigenous Research Showcase, and we're we're very excited that uh, you've decided to spend some time with us today as as we share our work. Okay, so I'm going to start just by acknowledging the lands in which we're situated on the territories of the Cree, the Sotu, the Dakota, Lakota, and Nagoda in the homeland of the Métis Nation. And the University of Regina is on Treaty 4 lands with a presence in Treaty 6. Um, I'm going to read this small little poem here on the side and then talk about this just a little bit um, as a way to think about this beyond procedural ethics, but beyond just a thing that you say you do so that you feel right, um, so that you said you did your duty, because I think that's one of the things I like to slow down with this. So as we state this, we want to slow our pace not just words to be said or deeds to be done. As non-Indigenous people, a way to pause and hold that pause around our settler common sense and how the world is ready made for us. Um, so the one way when I first came to this was, I always got tension around when we have procedural ethics of things, um, that we do things so that we feel like we did the right thing and then we can move on, um, that we don't hold that prolonged pause. Um, and I think as settler people or as non-Indigenous people, we have a very easy way we do this. Um, the one place that I learned about this first and the one that I love most was Mark Rifkin's writing. Um, and I have his little book up here, but he talks about this in his first chapter, um, this idea of settler common sense, this idea that the world is ready made for settler people, for non-Indigenous people to not think about where they're living, to not think about how their life is ready made for them so they don't have to take pauses. Um, and he talks about it through this really beautiful idea and a very simple idea uh, buying a home. And so he talks about this idea essentially when he got his first academic position, one of the first things he was ever told was, okay, well, you got a nice position. Um, you're living in a city now. Um, the next step is essentially buy a house. That seems like the next logical thing to do. His friends would tell him that. Banks would tell him that. Um, colleagues would tell him that. All these kind of things that that's the next logical step. And so when he went to go through that process of buying a house, he said, okay, um, it's pretty simple. You have all these things ready made for you. You have mortgages in place, you have banks, you have friends, you have families, you have realtors. Um, essentially that process is ready made um, for you to not acknowledge how deeply political um, that action is. To say that the idea of land ownership, um, that sits within an ongoing colonial framework that makes it possible so that you don't even have to recognize it. So that you can dwell in a place and not even know. Um, any of the history or any of the ways that you're involved um, actively at an everyday level in little formative ways that reproduce a colonial relation. Um, so his book did that through a beautiful sense, especially through that small notion of buying a house. That's one of those active little formative ways we have that happen in our everyday lives as non-Indigenous people that we can just keep walking. We don't have to pause. We don't have to think very long. Um, and we never have to question the world around us because it is ready made for us. And oftentimes we do that with research. We do that with recreation programming. And that's where both of us are situated um, in this area of recreation, leisure and research. Um, often we come from the place that um, we can step into communities. They're ready made for us that we're gonna do well. That process is reciprocal right off the hop. Um, that we will provide beneficial outcomes in that sense. Um, and same with recreation programs, there's that assumed benefit that comes with them that we don't even think that maybe they're producing colonial relations at times and in what ways. Um, so I like to start that place to say, okay, the land acknowledgement, it shouldn't be thought of as procedural. Um, it's something that for non-Indigenous people, we have to hold that pause a little longer to say, like, let's think about it with those little active everyday ways of how we do it. So um, we'll jump from that point. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. All right, a little bit about uh, 
who we are. Um, so Michael and I have been uh, fortunate enough to spend a fair bit of our academic careers together uh, and doing our PhDs together at the at the University of Alberta. So that's also how we come about this sort of co-composition as we collaborate on on uh, on quite a few projects together now as well. But just uh, quickly, um, I am a, a settler from uh, southwestern Ontario, the Kitchener Kitchener Waterloo area. Uh, for those of you familiar with that part of the country, uh, I've traveled a fair bit over the last couple of years, uh, most recently moving from the from Edmonton, uh, where I finished my PhD in the uh, Faculty of Kinesiology, Sport and Recreation. And in terms of my uh, research interests or sort of how I come about uh, our discussion today, I primarily engage in, in participatory community-based work uh, or youth-led participatory action research. And so I position the young people that I work alongside as co-researchers and, and as sort of interconnected with all, all aspects of, uh, the, of the research process. And uh, just some photos of myself uh, and my partner and our beloved uh, English Cocker Spaniel, Frankie. I always usually just include a photo of Frankie, but uh, Ainsley has picked up on that when I share my presentations with her. So I promise to share a photo with uh, with uh, <laughs> with the three of us today. So, so on that note, I don't have a picture of my partner or my dog, so hopefully no one here said. Um, so I was born in Calgary. Uh, I'm in a food family, family of chefs, and that kind of started um, my love for food and a lot of my research around gardening and community gardens. Um, and that led to me working in inner city places. And I moved from Calgary to Edmonton uh, to do my undergraduate degree. Um, and I stayed there throughout the whole time because I met some people. Uh, I met people like Tristan, I met people like uh, Jean Clandon, and I met people like Janice Huber, Sean Lassar, all these people who said, okay, these are places where you can grow. Um, places where you can grow in certain ways. And that was largely around narrative inquiry and thinking about the relational ethics of recreation practice, how people come together in recreation programs and thinking about how we inquire into those moments of coming together. Um, so I did my PhD in Alberta around um, inner city places and precarious housing situations and a community garden program that was going on there. Um, and I also, after that, moved to Montreal for about a year. Um, to do a postdoc there. And I'll talk a little bit more of those experience, I guess, in a little bit here. And that's me with corn behind me, quite love corn. <laughs> Zucchini today. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna speak about um, essentially this idea of ripples and reverberations, because me and Tristan were thinking, okay, how are we gonna start this conversation? Um, today um, and see, we weren't where, sure where to begin. Um, we don't have findings in place. We're very early on in our research progress and it wasn't a sense of, okay, um, we have all these findings that show, so we didn't know where to begin in many ways. And we had this conversation of where we can start. And so it was really around how we're gonna talk about our ongoing engagement with the community and really our beginnings of essentially how to attempt to live out co-compositions with community members, um, how to do that with the Growing Young Movers program that we're starting to work with. Um, and we thought this was a fitting point to kind of think about is, okay, what are those ripples or reverberations that we had from past work to say, these are impacting us. These are the things that impact or kind of live within us over that time and say, because of these past experiences and past projects, this is what lingers in us now. Um, this is what changes the way we go about our work um, and how we wanted to imagine these research beginnings as we found ourselves in Regina. Um, and so we thought it was a fitting place to start there um, because we thought these beginning points are always really important when we think about research and how we do those little imaginations off the start. Um, so I'll say often we, in research, we don't talk about that. Um, how those previous projects build upon others to make, say, those are the things that shape the living of subsequent topics. Um, in narrative inquiry, we often go there quite a bit. Um, we say, okay, it's within the continuity of your experience as a researcher that you hold on and you sit with these things and they kind of keep on working on you. And you say, okay, how are they gonna work on me? How are they changing how I think about my next project or how I continue to engage? Um, and the first place I'll talk about this, um, just so you have an idea of how this happened in narrative inquiry and how this gets talked about um, is, Clandon and Kanan Lassard's work, um, 
they were doing a project essentially with early school leavers or what would normally be termed as high school dropouts. Um, and they were working with these youth who were negotiating these places of school, essentially. Um, they had these forward looking stories of wanting to finish school. Um, yet the complexity of their lives wasn't really respected in school places. So they started to think about this idea of early dropping out of school as a process, not an act. Um, and they were sharing essentially how their identities in schools, um, it was tenuous at times. Those weren't the places where they felt the wholeness of their lives being respected. Often for the youth, they talked about how when they were in schools, those inst institutional narratives of who they were, um, that overrode everything. Those stories of them at risk um, as indigenous youth with the numbers beside them saying these are the rates, those were the stories that were told of them. And so they often had a difficulty of saying like, how can I actually negotiate that um, when I have this story already told of me um, and my wholeness of my being isn't being respected on these places. And so they kept kind of thinking with these worlds of the youth saying, okay, um, the wholeness of themselves isn't being respected on school landscape. So if we step into another project, how do we make sure we can attend to their wholeness if what we want to focus is on their experiences, their familial knowledge that comes to schools and how they shape schools? Um, how do we do that? How do we make sure that we're not limiting them by just hearing them in schools? Because if that's a place they feel limited, we won't get to know about their lives. Um, so one of the things they talk about, the reverberation within their own work was saying, where we meet youth matters. It mattered deeply to them because they knew they wouldn't get to hear a lot of stories if we met them in the places of school. And if that's the only place we met them, because that was a tenuous world, but they also wanted to come alongside that negotiation of saying, let's change the story of school. Let's recompose those places alongside them if we can. Um, so a lot of their thinking about ripples and reverberations came from the place um, after they finished that early school leaver program was about setting up an arts program. Um, that was within the school, but not within the school, outside the mandated curriculum, but within the halls of the school. Um, as a way to say where the youth, where they met the youth mattered, um, but also having it outside the institutional curriculum world. Um, to say we can do it after school hours, we're not within the mandated curriculum, but we want to try and compose the space differently. Um, and so that was some of the reverberations idea that came from it. And we're gonna talk about some of those reverberations we had for ourselves. To say, those are the things that are carrying with us as we started some of our stuff here in Regina. So I'll jump to some of my own here. And so what I'm gonna talk about is essentially a narrative from a past experience um, from when I started at McGill. And I remember quite deeply that early point of saying, when I was starting at McGill, um, the first thing I had to do um, before I even got there was a sense of, I was finishing out my doctoral and I had to put in a shirt postdoc fellowship. Um, I sent this letter to the community, um, to Amelia and said, um, would you support this? this is what I'm thinking about. And it's this huge long winded email uh, with all these really eager ideas around familiar knowledge of food and the Ganawage community um, struggling with how it was told struggling with diabetes in the community. And there was a tension around that. And I wanted to essentially focus on the stories of food in that community. And I had this huge long-winded kind of email, really eager, really excited, um, all these certainties in there, all this stuff. Um, and she sent this short little response to me saying like, she'd be happy to support if it becomes a reality. I probably had like a two page document, um, short little response. Um, and so it essentially did become a reality. Um, and I ended up finding my way in Montreal. And I remember us sitting down about a month or so into our, my time there. Um, and we were just talking about the project. Um, and it was at a little conference and we're sitting at a banquet table. Um, and I get into my eager talk about, okay, like familiar knowledge, food, all these kind of exciting things around gardening, around what they were doing. Um, and she asked me just two questions after I was sitting there. She's like, how long are you gonna be here? And how long does your funding last? They're pretty sincere questions. And I answered in a very honest way of the sense of, I wasn't sure how long I was gonna be there. Um, it depended on job markets in many ways. And my funding lasted for two years. 
And I just remember sitting there for that moment and her saying, I don't know if you're going to get what you want done. You're going to have to change up your clock here. You're going to have to rethink what you're doing. And so that often sits with me. And so I'll go to the next slide here of how this kind of reverberated with me um, or how these puzzles sit with me. Um, the first was the sense of often as researchers, we come from this place that we use participants. Um, we use them for our own benefits in many ways, and we're asked to come with certainty. Um, when I was filling out applications, one of the first things we do is to ask for certainty in what we're going to do. Um, what's going to come out of it? How is it going to contribute to literature? How is that process going to go in exact sense? Um, with predetermined research goals in mind. Um, essentially, when we write those things, we almost talk about the people we're going to work with in this weird utilitarian sense of their objects to be used. Um, and that's how we frame it. Um, they're people we can learn from. Um, it doesn't have a sense of, okay, I'm going to come alongside them, I'm going to learn with them, and I'm going to become with them. And that's how I'm thinking about my research. It's almost, okay, are these the right people for my project? And that's about it. Um, and so there's always that shift in myself to think about, okay, how do we talk about our work? It's not so much using participants, um, but to become with them, to become part of the questions they are living. Um, not the questions we come with beforehand. And I think that can be a really hard part when we're always asked to come with certainty in our work. The second part that I'm going to talk about here is stepping into the midst as a researcher. Um, in narrative inquiry, we talk about this a lot. There's often this discussion of, okay, we step into parades that are already already going on. So you see a parade going on and you might step in and you just kind of figure out, okay, this thing's still moving. Um, it was moving before I got here, and it's going to move when I leave, too. So we step into the midst of lives, social and personal, that are already ongoing, and sometimes we forget about that a lot. Um, Amelia reminded me of that constantly in a beautiful way of, we'd sit down and she'd tell me about how the St. Lawrence Seaway was, their access to it was disrupted. Um, she talked about the train tracks cutting across their land. Um, she talked about Oka, she talked about the limited mobility they had um, and how their community was essentially the size of a postage mark now. And I got to learn more and more about how researchers came into that community, how she spoke about them as being mosquito researchers or helicopter researchers. And I felt myself always pulled into those stories because I was in the midst of what was being lived out there. I was just figuring out how I was making sense of myself in that place how those stories have been shared already, um, how those negotiations were ongoing. Um, and so I was beginning to understand how it was part of those conversations that were already happening. Um, and I had more sense of, okay, um, when they have their own ethics boards approval processes that I was stepping into that because there was a history there that I had to learn before I could even do anything, that we can't just jump in and begin, um, that there's almost a slow waiting in to understanding what we're going into. The other one that I'll talk here that kind of hits hard um, is when we think about our relationships contingent upon funding. As early career researchers, I think this is one of the hardest things um, for us. Um, when I was doing my postdoc too, the sense when Amelia asked me, how long is your funding lasting? There's almost this feel that my use value or our relationship will only exist if it's funded or if it's fundable. And so our relation, our being, our coming together sits within that narrative of saying, the way we're gonna come together is only if it's assessed or worthy as fundable, and then we'll work together. Then we'll find ways to make this world better together. But without that, no. Um, so I always found that one of those things that she always asked me when you're sitting and you're going forward, when we know you're leaving, and what she asked me on those last days, if we, when we know you're going somewhere, um, you know you can push against those moments. You're not in a two-year postdoc. You're not finishing a master's. You're not finishing a PhD. A relationship doesn't have to be contingent on funding. It doesn't have to be situated within a certain time clock of assessment. And she always said, be cognizant of that. Um, and so that sat with me quite deeply here when I started in Regina. Of the first thing I didn't want to do was have an application before a relation. Um, and I think that was something that we and Tristan, when we were working with growing young movers, 
we didn't start with the application. We started with sitting down, um, getting to learn some of the questions that we're living in that community of growing young movers, which we'll talk about more. Um, and lastly is this idea of renaming our commitments. Um, I think we all know institutionally what our defined commitments are and how we're assessed. Um, sometimes those bump awkwardly with the commitments that we have relationally within communities and how we can explain those things. Um, and so it's sometimes just saying, how can we rename some of those commitments that sit outside of the institutional world, but are part of our institutional world? That we know community-based research is becoming more prominent, um, that we're having struggles in it in any ways. Um, but also trying to say it doesn't need to be recognized within operationalizing friendship. Um, how many hours I'm with someone um, and putting that into my assessments, a very different kind of discussion of thinking about my commitments. Um, so those are the little areas that kind of sit with me from prior experience from that small little talk with Amelia in the many days that had after. So uh, Michael's mentioned a lot of some of our common reverberations and, and ripples through all of our research, but thinking back to some of my earlier experiences, particularly in community and, and some of the ones that sort of continue to sit with me as, as we move along in, in some of the stuff, the stuff that we're doing alongside the community now, are my earliest experiences in, in what was my doctoral work, um, which was a an ongoing uh, youth-led participatory action research project um, alongside youth who would identify as living without a home or uh, would be considered homeless. So either living in a shelter or couch surfing, sleeping in their car um, or sleeping on the streets. And so I can think back to some of my earlier days into the, into the program and, you know, really, really thinking about um, what brought me to that space uh and, and in particular you know some of the shifts that i was experiencing in power relations um as sort of a an eager you know wide-eyed uh graduate students uh you know entering the program and entering the community uh alongside people who um of course i had great difficulty relating to in terms of lived experiences, of course, not a, not identifying as someone who had ever experienced homelessness. I uh, found myself um, spending a fair bit of time reflecting on and, you know, being aware of some of the, the shifts and relations around myself as the researcher and them as the participants. And so I can, as I was preparing our talk today, I went back to my field notes book from my PhD research, which seems like forever ago, but some of my notes and some of the things I jotted down were around, you know, some of the gazes that I experienced from the young people. And, and as Michael described Amelia's words as a, a mosquito researcher or, or someone who sort of helicopters in until their needs are fulfilled. And those are some of the, certainly, although the young people I was working with um, did not articulate orally, were certainly, the, um, you know, sort of the subject of the ways in which uh, our earlier interactions occurred. Uh, in the programming. In addition to that, some of the other things that continue to sit with me is this notion of some of the tensions of friendships. I spent a, a fair bit of time in the program and got to know the youth um, a fair bit, uh, but worked very hard, you know, to let go of, of uh, again, and it relates back to the power relations too, but thinking about how you know, this notion of friendship is is uh, really important to me in, in the work that I do and and what that then means for how the research is shaped. And so that's something I continue to to reflect on and write on is this notion of relation relationships and and friendships. And finally, there one of the other things that can, that continues to sort of reverberate through our work is this notion of co-engagement, particularly as we you know, think about the co-compositions of the youth leaders and growing young movers and the young people that that we're spending time along is, you know, what role do they, do they, what role can they play and should they play in shaping the overall, you know, nature of the work that we do. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't include uh, this uh, very surprising and upsetting quote um, that my neighbor uh, 
sort of threw over the fence to me not long ago and he asked me what I did and I described you know some of the work that Michael and I were doing with growing young movers at the Mama Wayatin Center in North Central Regina and his response was wow you're really getting to see how the other half live and I added the italicies for emphasis but what he was really getting at was why would you want to do that and um at any rate i'll i'll uh, i'll uh, i'll let that sit with everyone as we go through our our uh, our chat today and the photo in the corner there is a photo of a, an abandoned ymca building that was used to house the uh, program that i um, became involved with as a part of my doctoral work So I'll just quickly talk about this area. So one of the things that we're kind of positing in our work is what we want to focus on is this idea of co-compositions that we, if we're going to discuss this idea of, okay, we want to move towards co-composing. Um, we want to move towards living ethically or with relational responsibilities with the people we work with. Um, in many ways, often in narrative inquiry and other places, um, we speak about this something as akin to friendship. Um, and so I'm going to read this quote on the side first, and I'll talk a little bit about this because it's a way of how we can reconstruct the idea of research process for ourselves um, and how we just name ourselves in our work and what matters for what we do. Um, and so this was from quite a while ago. Um, Jean Clanda and Michael Connolly were talking about a very early project they had with teachers um, and they were inviting more researchers in and tensions occurred in the process. I mean, essentially, they said, we have shown how successful negotiations and the application of, of principles do not guarantee a fruitful study. The reason, of course, is that collaborative research can, constitutes a relationship. In everyday life, the idea of friendship implies a sharing, an interpenetration of two or more person's spheres of experience. Mere contact is acquaintanceship, not friendship. The same may be said for collaborative research, which requires a close relationship akin to a friendship. Relationships are joined, as McIntyre implies, by the narrative unities of our lives. And so this kind of highlights some of the areas that, when we were thinking about our work, um, was really reconstructing the research process as saying, there's a huge undercurrent to what we do. Um, yes, we have questions that we put into proposals and grants. Yes, we're interested in certain puzzles that we have within our fields. But there's an undercurrent in what carries us. This undercurrent of how do we live together as researchers? Um, that we are part of this process to say we're holding this prolonged pause that Mark Rifkin was talking about. That we have to sit there with that settler common sense and say, okay, we want to disrupt how we live together. We want to be able to think about that a little bit longer and say, how are our lives coming together in these little daily ways? Um, and how are our research processes sometimes not attentive to this idea of friendship? And how do we try and live that out as much as we can in our work? And how do we negotiate that? And that's one of those troubling places that we just try and sit with as long as we can so that we attend to it as much as we can. So I'll just end that point really there. All right, Growing Young Movers. Um, so some of you who have joined today might be familiar with the program or have maybe heard about it, um, you know, through colleagues, friends, or other community members. Um, but the program that Michael and I have been fortunate enough um, to be invited to be a part of um, is an after school wellness program that's um, facilitated in and with uh, the Mama Wayatin Center in North, uh, North Regina. And uh, have, if, if you have never had a chance to visit the Mama Wayatin Center or Scott Collegiate, um, it's one of the most beautiful community centers uh, that I have ever been in. Um, it's a very unique community space. Uh, between, you know, the, the Scott Collegiate High School and the Mama Wayatin um, uh, Community Center, uh, which is, of course, facilitated by the city. And then there's also a Regina Public Library there as well. Um, and if you're looking for a reason to visit, there is the culinary uh, pathway there and uh, the Scott Collegiate uh, students, uh, along with uh, a Red Seal chef, offer lunch um, at a very reasonable rate. Uh, and you can um, buy and uh, enjoy your lunch uh, right sort of in the, the city hub uh, of the Mama Wayatin Center. I, uh, I highly recommend. We 
we were there for a meeting a couple of weeks ago and had um, smoked elk meat poutine, uh, which was all prepared and smoked by the, uh, the culinary program. So if that doesn't entice you, I'm not sure uh, what will. So what's unique then about growing young movers is not only their, you know, their their disruption of what we might consider sort of to be an, a, a normal after school program. And we'll talk a little bit more about what we mean by that. Um, but it, it's it's facilitated by and with um, uh, Dr. Brian Lewis, who's the executive director and also uh, a part time teacher at Scott Collegiate. But um, it's also facilitated by youth mentors who are either um, students of the leadership pathway at Scott Collegiate or have come by uh, um, have come by the, the mentor role or their youth mentor role uh, another way. Okay. Talk a little bit about this, Michael. Yeah, um, I love quiet moments, so I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, but really, uh, what I wanted to talk about here is just some of those early beginnings we had with GYM. Um, and really, it was we met through a web of relationship, partly of um, we knew Brian through relationships we already had. Uh, I knew him through uh, other researchers I worked with that I they said, someone to sit down with, um, you guys might jive, um, that you could talk and see about things with your own work. So it was within this whole web of relationships when we first started. Um, and when we first started sitting down with Brian about a year ago around this time, um, one of the things that I think both of us when we were sitting there was around some of the tensions that Brian explained to us. Um, and there were stories like the global news, um, you have all these broader community kind of people, um, those outside of GM or Drew IM were really interested in this idea that, okay, there's a lot of success with this program. And that was specific to certain measurements, whether that was equated to increased attendance in school, um, graduation, university, work placement, and after. Um, and the tension really sat in this idea that the success stories were based on an idea of deficit. Um, it was reproducing a story that essentially undermined the youth experiences to outcome-based measures um, and saying that the youth are in deficit and need in fixing. And the thing that we're gonna talk about is success here is that we have an effective intervention tool being GYM. Um, and so when we were sitting here and having these conversations, our biggest thing was this idea that um, the way that we talk about recreation, um, especially in this idea of interventionist log logics, this idea that the program is what makes the results and we often justify programs based on communities deficits. Um, the whole reason we have programs in place in communities like North Central often is justified from a place of deficit and we can never leave that conversation. It's become so ingrained that that's how we start it. Um, we had an issue with that starting point. When we sat with Brian, we have an issue of saying like, um, we don't wanna place them as deficit. That's not the beginning point of these programs. These beginning points are somewhere else for us. Um, outside this notion of deficit, outside of this notion of intervention, um, to say we want to learn about how they're composing their lives in these places and how we can be a little more attentive to that and what knowledge they actually bring to these programs. Not that we're filling them up with knowledge uh, where the program is a great intervention tool, but they bring stuff there and they shape that program in different ways. So it was a lot about the shared caring for pushing up youth's voice um, to say they come with strengths, they come with knowledge, and we don't need to justify our programs through a deficit base. And so I'll go on to the next slide here and quickly say, well, Brian talked about this and how we experience it in our own lives of um, this idea of deficit based often driving programming. Um, it happens a lot in literature too, but there is starting to be some pushback in recreation and leisure saying, okay, we're gonna slow down and start thinking about this. Participants in programs, um, whether it's in schools and recreation and after school, we shouldn't place them as passive recipients who are gonna get filled up and we can change them in the type of citizen we want. Um, there's a lot of new research coming out and this is probably gonna be going around for a while, but momentum builds around this idea that we're starting to notice these dominant interventionist logics that are saying, okay, we sit with this quiet implicit good of recreation, um, but we never really question how some of our programs are there specifically to this idea. We have certain outcomes in mind, uh, we have predetermined measures and often they're in this idea of we're trying to create an ideal neoliberal citizen. 
someone who's going to be productive in society because off the start we can't see them that way. Um, so this is where there's that quiet thrust of Eurocentric values being pushed often onto communities. These are those small ways where I say that Mark Rifkin off the start, um, that pause that we're trying to sit with as long as we can. This is the active involvement of our recreation in doing this. Um, these are daily formative ways that recreation continues a colonial relation by saying we have a good intervention program for you. We see you as deficit, we're gonna make you better. That's what we wanna step outside of and say they have strength. Um, they come to these programs with knowledge, knowledge how to care for youth, uh, little ones, and we're just trying to listen um, so that we can shape programs and have practitioners understand more what they bring to these places so that the places can work for them instead of us working on them. All right, I'm mindful of time. So I'm gonna just share a little bit about um, some of the things that we're up to alongside growing young movers. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously our overall um, goal, as Michael mentioned, is to disrupt some of that common narrative around uh, not only youth, but also uh, after school wellness spaces that are, you know, are present in, you know, some of the stories and things that Brian shared with Michael and I in our earlier conversations, but are also present and continue to be present in, in the literature around this topic. And so we focus a lot on in our work, you know, having conversations with the young people around, um, you know, what they bring to their practice and understanding of leadership. And that was, you know, also present in, in uh, Sherelle's story in the global news video. We also are interested in not only within growing your movers, but also how their stories of leadership and how their experiences of leaderships, leadership, you know, extends beyond school and growing young movers and uh, into their community and, and into their um, families as well. And finally, we're, we're most interested in, again, sort of shifting that power uh, from, you know, researcher to really, and being the ones that are the keepers of knowledge to, um, you know, wondering what 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 knowledge do you bring to growing young movers, and what what are all of the great things that we can we can learn from them? So uniquely, then some of uh, our research uh, team composition then includes not only uh, um, Michael and myself, but also two um, Scott Collegiate teachers, and then Dr. Brian Lewis. And so we've been engaged uh, alongside ten growing young mover youth mentors. Uh, and whether we meet weekly or biweekly or a couple times a week, or, you know, whether we grab a, a, a coffee or lunch, um, we have a regular commitment to being present in, 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 in growing young movers programming and in the community. Do you want to share a little bit about how yeah, the conversations can, going? Um, so just quickly, won't take too much mm -hmm. time here. Um, what they're asking us to consider just from the small conversations we've had over the last couple of months. Um, so you can jump to the next slide and I'll quickly just talk about one quote that I just tend to sit with from one of the participants I sit with. Um, she describes herself as I'm the thread that's in between. Um, and I'll say before I even begin, we're very early on in these things, but it's just something that we're thinking about. And she asked me to think about herself as the thread in between. Um, specifically in the way of how she navigates her life as the threads that makes connections to different possibilities in her world. Um, on the GYM landscape, she often talks about this. She's a thread for the little ones of knowing what they may be experiencing. And then trying to be there knowing that she's had moments in her life where no one was ever there for her. So she's a thread for possibility for them. And I'm going to go through this kind of quick just because of time. Um, but I'm going to sit more with the shifting familial threads really around this idea for herself, um, that thread in between, not just within the GYM landscape, not just within the school landscape that she's supporting the, and mentoring the little ones there, um, but she's a thread in between her family to say, how can we understand our relationships as trusting? And I always feel myself pulled into this. And I remember one of our conversations, we were just sitting there and we were probably like an hour and a half into it, um, just talking and her mom called her and during that conversation, you heard her mom asking, who are you with? Um, are you okay? 
And she answered the questions and she told me, okay, there's sometimes some trust issues in our family because of previous relations with practitioners. Um, and she told me about a moment how with a whole different health practitioner, she built trust with not only her mom, um, but herself and that every time she'd sit down with her, um, she'd also go up to her mom after and say like, no, I just talked with your daughter, she's doing great. Um, so that her mom felt pulled into this trusting relationship with health practitioner. And I remember that day after that call and her mom going to pick her up and I wasn't thinking too much. Um, and I just said bye to her. And I remember watching her get in the van and kind of going off. And I just remember sitting there the next day saying, okay, um, if I'm going to rename my commitments as being relationally responsible to act as a friend um, to the question she's living within her community, within her family of shifting a whole story of trust. Um, I kept sitting there thinking, okay, should I have gone over to that van? Said hello. Um, started to build those trusting relationships that she was trying to manage, uh, imagine and make that possibility within her family. Um, so those are those places when I talk about and when we think about this idea of renaming our responsibilities, um, this is where I'd say this is where I feel it. This is how we assess some of our work, how we're living as friends, if we are in those moments, if we're being attentive or if we're just being attentive to, okay, I got my recorder on for that little moment and that was good. Or was I responding enough? Um, so I'll end there um, in that part, just as a thinking. So I've included just a, a few sort of snapshots from, from some um, words from one of the young people that I've had the fortune of getting to know and to talk to talk a little bit with. Um, she talks a lot about how, you know, in her earlier life before, you know, becoming involved in growing young movers, um, that her family positioned her as a follower and that sort of from her mom to her grandmother. And now that she's gotten older and got some experience in, in being a youth leader and mentor in growing young movers, um, that's changed a lot. And that not only does she feel more like a leader as it from her experience, but so her mom and her grandma and her other family members have also, you know, reconsidered um, her position and, and now sort of see her as a leader as well. And um, all of the things that, you know, all of the great potential that this can lead to for her. In addition to that, and this is uh, certainly, I think Michael and I could say for the, the young people that we've been um, getting to know is that uh, they they see themselves a lot in these young kids that grow on young movers, and they find it very natural, um, whether it's because they looked after young siblings from a very young age, or whether it's because, um, you know, they also had some problematic experiences in school or, or whatever that might look like. Um, they find it very easy to, to, for the, to relate to the young people and they can see that the young people look up to them and that's very meaningful for them. And just wrapping up, do you wanna share about where we're going, Michael? I won't say too much here, um, but we have initial questions largely in this area of um, how are they composing their lives as leaders? Not just within the GOIM space, but in saying, uh, okay, um, how do they do this in other communities within their home lives on the school landscape and how that might transition with them as they go forward so they can provide their own counter stories. And so we can listen to those counter stories of disrupting that notion of what that community is, of how they're storied, um, of what North Central is and saying like, there is a different story there. We're just not being attentive sometimes. That deficit narrative has sat so hard that we can't even hear their stories of leadership. Um, which are quite present in their lives. And the other aspect is this idea of stories of li living relationally and what that means, um, whether that's in relationship with practitioners like ourselves in research, um, whether it's their relationship with the little ones and how we actually get to define what a meaningful relationship is um, and how they come to understanding that within their lives. And we see that as a great place for us to kind of understand um, what that means for us, whether that's as researchers or as practitioners, um, that they may ask to say, well, you need to respond in these certain ways, or you need to consider these things. If you're going to say, this is a good relationship, this is what it looks like to us. Or, this is how we imagine it. Um, so it's kind of a call to say, what do we need to take up? Um, so I think we'll probably end there because I'd rather leave time. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.